I don't know if anybody's going to be on. No, I don't know. But it's all right. People like it recorded anyway. We know people watch it later on. Yeah. See the numbers of views on all the videos. Uh -huh. so. Okay, if we can. Uh, <laughs> hey, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> right? That's why we make 10 minutes between one Shia to another, Marty, right? that if you were here last week and retained your handouts that you take out the one that has the map in the front if not i have other hand additional handouts please okay while you do that i'm going to start with our bracha okay. and then we'll get uh, back to uh, uh work Baruch atah Adonai, lohinu melech olam, asher kiddushonu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu, la'asok b'divrei Torah. Okay. All right, so it is the handout that uh, is being redistributed today that we're going to focus on with some other remarks. Now, okay, just a quick review. Remember we talked about the fact we started discussing the first crusade that was established by Pope Urban II, okay, and focused primarily on uh, the uh, opportunity, I'll use that word in quotes, okay? for the uh, both the nobles and the commoners in those days to uh, go on this crusade, on this mission, okay? Uh, our numbers are dwindling a little bit. I hope that more reflects other things, okay? So I wanted us, and we read the fact, and I, I want to point out through the map, on this page, if you notice, uh, there are three routes that are described in this on this map. Okay, the uppermost route. I'm going to say the one that starts, sort of, uh, not. Uh, okay, it's more where Lux uh, Luxembourg it starts. Notice how that goes through parts of the lower part of Germany, down past Vienna, okay, all the way to Istanbul, okay? That is the route, okay? There should be any other handouts left? They were all given up, okay. All right, that is the route that I want us to be most aware of. Okay, because that route takes them through northern, uh, I'm sorry, southern, the Rhine area, and that is the route that is going to take them specifically, okay, to the areas that uh, we're focusing on, right? We read last time that uh, eyewitness account by Solomon Bar Samson. Okay, as to what happened on May 27th, 1096, when the Crusaders came through Mayence. And we pointed out there that 
the fact that the Pope was successful in getting this crusade started was because of the fact that of two or three criteria. Number one was basically for the nobles, there was honor, wealth, things like that. But also for the common people, there was the benefit of wealth, but a greater benefit on the part of the church was the fact that it, it removed from them any uh, absolutions or it absolved them really from penances, okay? And that was an important element, okay? In other words, they got their slate, so to speak, wiped clean in regards to the church. And therefore, as a result of that, it would imply, okay, that they would get a direct route to heaven, right? Among other things, okay? So we had, we looked at that particular item. So I thought when I came across this uh, report, okay, it's called a map journal. It was written by a student. We'll see at the end when we complete it. But it would give us not only additional, some additional information that I shared about the rationale for the First Crusade and Pope Urban, okay? But it would also uh, give us uh, some So if you have that, you can follow a 12 night front page map are regarded as one of the most infamous events of the Middle Ages. The first crusade was a watershed moment for Jews in medieval Germany. During the crusade, lesser Christian nobles led attacks against Jewish communities in the Rhineland. That's why I pointed out to that uppermost route that they went, okay? The other two routes, one started uh, lower in France near Monaco. One started uh, from Amsterdam and Paris. Okay? But it was the topmost route there that was significant. Many Jewish people chose martyrdom, which is what we heard from Bar uh, Samson's report. Okay? While some chose baptism and some took their own lives. These massacres have left a deep imprint on Jewish historical memory. And we're going to see that as we go now to the second page, which she called uh, the Catholic Mission. And there again, we see that same map, the three areas. Okay. All right. So what is she telling us there? Okay. In France, Pope Urban II configures a plan to put together a Christian militia to aid the Byzantine Empire and take back Jerusalem from Islam. Okay? And so we see there for this map that shows the routes that they chose. Right? And you can see there clearly in that uppermost route, okay, it goes right through Mannheim, all right? Stuttgart is just below that, Munich, etc., Vienna, okay? And what does she tell us then? Okay, looking at the picture on the bottom of that page. When word of the first crusade began to spread, it sparked a movement of anti-Semitism throughout medieval Europe, particularly in France and Germany. Many Jewish people were living and working in wealthy communities in these areas. Okay? She doesn't spell it out, but we know now what communities she's referring to, the Rhineland, okay, Mines, Worms, Speyer. Okay, these we said were Jewish communities that had existed at least for three generations. Because if Rashi learned there and his teachers had learned there from Rabbeinu Gershom, that already tells us that there was at least three generations of Jews with yeshivas 
with institutions otherwise there in those communities. So they were well-established Jewish communities, communities that Rashi okay, would have known on a personal basis, okay? And it's very possible that he could have had age peers still living in those communities, okay? He went back to his native city, but others who could have been in yeshiva with him or teachers would have still been there, okay? Okay, and why was this important to these communities? They had supplies that Catholics needed for the Crusades, okay? In other words, they could buy food, they could buy horses, they could have horses, uh, uh, you know, hoofed, so to speak, a shoed, okay? The necessary, they had uh, equipment that they would need, so they would buy swords, scabbards, perhaps armor, okay? So these were well-established, okay, communities. Right. At a time, a lot of Jewish people were under scrutiny from the Muslim community and the Christians were blaming the Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus. Now you look at that, on the bottom of that previous of page two, you'll see a piece of artwork that shows the crucifixion, okay, and then somebody grabbing hold of the body. Okay. So this kind of art was very common, okay? Now, it's a small picture, but if you look very carefully at that picture, everybody, no, look at the person, could have been a woman holding on, but look at two pictures of males with what would be called conical hats, okay? Does that remind anybody of something? Yeah, the KKK. It does, right? <laughs> but that's not what I had in mind. It's a good guess. Oh, come on, no? Okay, come on. Okay. Conical hats was a symbol that a Jewish male was required to wear by the church in certain communities. It was a way of designating that person. Look at the faces. They had beards, long noses, etc. That was a way of des designating somebody who is Jewish. So why would they wear it? Well, the Jews, that? these were Jews gathered there. That was the whole point. It was as if to say, see, it was the Jews who arranged for the crucifixion. By the way, anybody who studies the history of the Holocaust should know that it is from the idea of that the, the Nazis uh, uh, designated outward signs to designate who Jews were, was based on Catholic principles and laws that the church had in the Middle Ages. Okay, so this example of these conical hats, okay, on these men, Okay, and looking at the pictures, you can see, again, the, the figure, the long noses, the beards, etc., designating, implying that it was the Jews who were responsible for the crucifixion. Okay, so that was a motif there. So that is why the author of this paper, I suggest, included that picture there and it therefore wanted to imply the significance of Catholic uh, anti-Semitism beginning at this time, okay? And she makes a quick reference to it. Okay, photo, anti-Semitic propaganda from the medieval ages. Jewish people are pictured standing around watching and being nonchalant about Jesus and the cross as a Christian is seen at his feet clinging to him, trying to save him. This is a painting, not a picture. Right, but it is a painting of the time. In other words, that was done, clearly the conception. Okay, okay. 
now we see a a a, a focus now on the on the location that we want the Rhineland massacres. Okay. Now the photo is a map of Rhineland in Germany and the different communities that were attacked. Okay, so in other words, it's a focus of that first, of that earlier uh, path that the Crusaders took. Okay, and notice Cologne, they went to mines. Just south of mines is Speyer, Worms, Metz is not far from there, okay? So that is clearly these major cities, okay? And she writes, the Rhineland massacres were a series of mass murders of Jewish people and the destruction of the wealthy Jewish communities in Speyer, Mines, Metz, Worms, etc., carried out by the German Christian militia. These were the Crusaders. Thousands of Jewish people were killed were forced to convert and thousands of communities were destroyed. Although the original purpose of the Crusades was not anti-Semitic in nature, it turned into that due to the fact that Jewish people had a lot of supplies that the Crusaders needed and the Jewish people were seen as in the way of the mission. Okay? Many Jews were forced to either convert or be killed while few Jewish people were able to flee. Well, that doesn't make sense. They really needed the Jews for their supplies. Good point, Ada. Ada, its point is worthwhile. The person writing this report will ultimately have to deal with that question. I'm not going to answer it right now, okay? But uh, Sharashevsky, in his book, Okay, does deal with that question. Okay, and he and we're going to put forward his argument. Okay, and we'll see whether we accept it or not. Okay, going on with what the young lady wrote now in the next page of her report, we see a painting. Okay, a large painting that is supposed to be describing the massacres that actually occurred there in those cities, okay? All right, I skipped one page. I didn't feel it was, so we, we're continuing. Now it's page five out of nine. So one of her companions, the story goes, okay, picked up a knife to slaughter her son. This is called Rachel and her children, the description. But when the mother of the children saw the knife, she let out a loud and bitter lament. And she beat her face and breast crying, where are thy mercies, O God? In the bitterness of her soul, she said to her friend, do not slay Isaac in the presence of his brother Aaron, lest Aaron see his brother's death and run away. Aaron being the youngest child in the family, apparently. The woman then took the lad Isaac, who was small and very pretty, and she slaughtered him while the mother spread out her sleeves to receive the blood, catching it in her garment instead of a basin. When the child Aaron saw that his brother Isaac was sl slain, he screamed again and again, mother, mother, do not butcher me, and ran and hid under a chest. She had two daughters also who still lived at home, Bella and Matrona, beautiful young girls, the children of her husband, Rabbi Judah. The girls took the knife and sharpened it themselves that it should not be nicked. Remember we saw uh, Bar Simpson, Samson's reference, okay? Then the woman bared their necks and sacrificed them to the Lord God of hosts who had commanded us not to change his pure religion, but to be perfect with him, as it is written in Devarim there, Deuteronomy, perfect shall you be with the Lord your God. To me, mean to you. Yeah. When this righteous woman had made an end of sacrificing 
her three children to their creator. She then raised her voice and called out to her son, Aaron, Aaron, where are you? You also I will not spare, nor will I have any mercy. Then she dragged him out by his foot from under the chest where he had hidden himself, and she sacrificed him before God, the high and exalted. She put her children next to her body, two on each side, covering them with her two sleeves, and there they lay struggling in the agony of death. When the enemy seized the room, they found her sitting and wailing over them. Show us the money that is under your sleeves, they said to her. But when it was the slaughtered children they saw, they struck her and killed her upon her children, and her spirit flew away, and her soul found peace at last. To her applied the biblical verse from Hosea, the mother was dashed in pieces with her children. So again, this comes from another part of that section that we read from uh, Solomon Bar Samson. Okay. On the next, uh, the story shows how the Jewish people struggled during those massacres. The Crusaders forced them into choosing how they were going to die. Should be six out of nine in the right, lower right hand corner, it tells you. Yeah. It was either by the hand of a crusader, page six. Okay, suicide, killing your own family, or by choosing to go against their God and become Christian. So those were the choices. Suicide, being killed by the Crusaders, or conversion. Rachel chose to kill her own family, which is interesting because at the beginning of the story, Solomon Bar Simpson recalls that she had a hard time deciding between just letting her children convert or slaughtering them. Okay, this is the author of this uh, report. I think it really shows how dedicated and faithful these Jewish people were to their God, so much so that they would choose death rather than let their children or themselves go against him. I think Rachel is a perfect example of a martyr during these massacres. Okay. Then she skips, the author skips now impact. The first crusade caused the death of thousands of Jewish people and the destruction of various Jewish communities throughout Germany and other places throughout Europe as well. The first crusade was the first account of anti-Semitic massacres during the crusades. These massacres show the violent nature of the Crusaders and the Crusades as a whole. It also shows history behind the tension in the relationship between Christians and Jews, which is still very, still very relevant in the modern world. Now you'll see at the end, roughly when she wrote this. The massacres really highlight one of the first instances in history where the Jewish people are scapegoated, which this becomes a reoccurring theme throughout history. For example, at this time, the Jewish people were being blamed for the crucifixion of Jesus. And this was used as a justification for massacring them. And more recently, before World War II, the Jewish people were being blamed for the economic crisis in Germany. Okay. Now, she shows us a picture, a synagogue that stands in Mainz, Germany today. Wow. Okay. Is this the Holocaust Memorial there? What? Is this the Holocaust Memorial there? I don't know. No, it's a, it's she says it's a synagogue. Oh, a synagogue. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, she then lists her, right? She then lists her, her, uh, her sources, okay? One of them was Jacob Marcus's book, The Jew in Medieval World, okay, from which we took the, uh, our, our piece from Bar Samson. Yosef Yerushalmi, which is also a major important book, and the Jeremy Cohen's book. Okay. Now, she then goes through and shows some of the maps 
on the next page with again that picture of the symbol. Okay. Now, afterwards at the last page, this article was written by Caitlin Armstrong. Now, it seems to me that uh, it very well may be that this, this young lady was not Jewish that wrote it, okay? As an assignment for introduction to medieval Jewish history, spring 2018. Okay, so this report is a fairly recent. What? With Dr. Craig Perry at the University of Cincinnati. Okay. So I just thought, again, it would be a very interesting piece because number one, besides showing the maps, okay, emphasizing the impact of the destruction, okay, which meant, of course, that those cities, if they lost such a major, uh, I don't want to call it just source of revenue, but the, imp the death of so many of the Jewish community who were important uh, participants in the in the uh, economic welfare of those cities. Okay. Now, Sharashevsky, okay, in his book, okay, really wants to try to deal with this issue, okay, in some way. What is the the result of the first crusade, the impact? but particularly in regards to Rashi. Okay. After all, we could say where Rashi lived, okay, that would have been further south in France. So the Crusaders did not impact directly on his community. Okay. Okay. Or perhaps on his family. I say perhaps because we're gonna see another piece that I'm gonna share with you. At least three, if I'm not four. Masei uh, Hatzlav, right? Okay. All right. So he writes. He says, "What it would appear, while it would appear that neither Rashi nor the Jewish community of Troy was affected directly, physically affected." Okay by the First Crusade that wasn't true, as we see from the Rhine community, okay? And notice what happens, they were attacked both by the Crusaders, argues Shoshosi, and by mobs of Christians. Rashi was indeed deeply disturbed and it affected him spiritually and psychologically at the hardships and the extermination of Jewish communities. Remember, we said he lived there as a student, 10, roughly 10 years, 11 years, okay? He was already married then, okay? At least two of his daughters were perhaps born in those communities. So he had, I don't wanna say roots, but he certainly had connection to those communities, right? Uh -huh. Okay, now what we're going to look at in a moment is what I call a slicha. It is an elegy, a kind of liturgical poem, much like what we read on Tisha B'Av, okay, about the destruction, okay, and if you actually go through the kinos on Tisha B'Av, okay, okay, uh, if, we can actually find a copy of a elegy in the Tisha B'Av book that most of us Ashkenazic communities use. No. I can't say in the kinos. I can't say it's the one specifically written by Rashi, okay? But the one I'm going to share with you, or actually, if you have the second packet, yeah. all right? All right, it is in there. I have some additional copies for that too. But before we give those out, let's just introduce it and then we'll, we'll read it through, okay? Rashi basically is asking for forgiveness 
okay, for the Jewish community. He's sympathizing with the misery. How many times do I have to do this? Hopefully, this will be the last one. Okay, sympathizing okay. with the misery okay. of his people. Okay. An emergency situation has been detected. He in asks the Torah to act as an intermediary on behalf of the Jewish people to put in a good word for them attention. before Hashem. Attention. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. Proceed Citing the relationship that the Jewish people had with the, the Torah from the time of Moses through the prophets, including the exile to Babylonia and throughout various parts of Europe. Rashi's going to emphasize. No, I'm just introducing it so that we understand what we'll read. Okay? All right? that the basically he asks us the Torah to act as the intermediary, okay? Uh, and that because of the destruction, the exile itself. So in this packet, uh, okay, the first page was by Simpson. The second page now is called a slicha by Rash. I have a few copies. Do not re-enter the building until directed to by the proper authority. Attention. All right, attention. here's one more. Attention. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. Proceed to the nearest exit and leave the building. Do not re-enter the building until directed to by the proper authority. Okay, now, the reason... Um, on the one hand, the reason I want us to look at this is for two elements. Aspect number one is the fact that this is Rashi's, in a sense, personal response, psychologically, spiritually, to the destruction, the massacres that happened historically there attention, in the Rhine attention, area. Attention. Okay. Secondly, in this most of us are familiar with the idea that the Rashi was primarily a commentary, okay? That that's what he wrote, a commentary on the Chumash, a commentary on other parts of the Bible, a commentary on the Gemara, okay? What I want us to understand is Rashi and his students did much more, that he wrote other things. We know that he wrote Piske Halakha. We know that he wrote certain shuvas, certain responsa on certain kinds of questions. So that shouldn't surprise us that he, he as the rabbi of the community, and is one of the major rabbis of the time that people would turn to him, not only in his own community, but from other communities to write a chuvas, to write responsa, question, to answer questions. What few of us might realize by showing this example is that Rashi also had or began to have on his students and others an impact on the liturgy, on the tefillah, okay? And what, what, the, what that was, ultimately we'll talk about more in another session when we deal with Rashi's lasting influence. But this gives us an example that Rashi and his students, okay, were much more involved, not just in writing commentary, okay? I, I, I will come back, I'll give one other example, okay? We know clearly Attention. that Attention. in parts of the Attention. Gemara, Rashi did not write a commentary the on the entire the Gemara. Building. Do not re-enter the building until We have sections where it's very clear that Rashbam, his grandson, Actually, picked up 
and continue those commentaries in the Gemara. Now, most of us, when we think of Rashbam, okay, and I'll go into this more another time, think of him as his a Bible commentator. We don't necessarily think of him as writing commentary on the Gemara. But I want us to understand then that their, their uh, literary output, okay, was much greater than what we normally assume. Attention. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. Proceed to the nearest exit and leave the building. If we look at this now, again, excuse me, all right, the Slicha said that. It's directed towards the Torah that to act as an intermediary for the part of the Jewish people. Okay. Torah, perfect one. Okay. Okay, got it, got it. Well, does that bother the keynote or what? No, there are keynote on the destruction of worms, mines, etc. Yeah, Whether this one is in the classical Ashkenazic text that we use is, I don't know, to be very honest. Okay? Is it translated into Hebrew? This is, what, the, the, this one? Well, obviously, it must be. It I, I, I assume he wrote it in Hebrew, right. <laughs> okay? But the source I had it from translated into English. And I wanted it the English because I felt that it would be more accessible. Torah, perfect one. 2,000 years more ancient one. Beseech the Lord for the innocent dove. Okay, who is the innocent dove? The Jewish people. Okay. Plead every day with him who dwells in heaven. Okay. Again. Torah is to be the intermediary, to pity those who study you each moment, each season. Forty days and nights, the humblest of creatures studied you in heaven, he who was good and pleasant. He established a school and explained everything dark. He taught every detail exactly in order. Who does that refer to, you Moshe think? Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, exactly. They lingered in the desert 40 years, as it said. As reward for studying you, they lacked nothing. Okay, the mana, for example, that's what he's referring to. Okay, other things. After 40 years, they crossed over in joy, and in the lovely land you were recited. They continued their study, those splendid elders, until the prophets arose, giving wisdom like light. Attention, okay? attention, attention. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. When prophets, so notice this, we'll see how he goes. First, he talks about coming into the land of Israel, time of Joshua, remember, in, in Pirkei Avot, okay, it says in the first uh, first Mishnah, or second Mishnah, Pirkei Avot, okay, Masruli Yoshua, Yehoshua, the Zekenim, the Zekenim, Lanshei Knesset Hagadola. That's what he's, notice his picking up on this, okay? Those elders. When prophecy was gone, by the way, remember on Sheikh Knesset Gadola, traditionally that included Chagai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last of the prophets. Okay? When they were part of the last and right. They continue, right? When prophecy was gone, you were brought to Babylon. The men of the great assembly took you in love. Those who study you in the misery of exile, search out your secrets in every town and village. Your sages and scribes labor to acquire your words. Your goods are dearer to them 
than goods of silver and gold. Okay. Uh, if I had a source, I would okay. say, okay. okay, again, okay. probably from Mishle. Okay, some language. Young and old, they gather in study to extend the Torah's glory. They never leave you. Okay, going on. They're young in their schools, recite your words in face of hunger and thirst and every lack. In other words, already referring to the fact that they gave. Okay. Remember, certainly at the time of Rashi, and even in places you have children who learn by the trope, the psuki, and that's how they, what was common, okay? Many, many, but, right? But the point is reciting your words. In other words, okay? they spend their wealth counting and bringing it to those who anger you so that the Torah they may enjoy in honor. If it were not for the Jews who sing your song, you would be unsung from mouth and throat. Shiru Lashem Shir Chadash, Shiru Lashem Kol Haaretz. Throughout, we see that Pasuk in various places, particularly in Tehillim, right? Okay, seek revenge for your pious ones, for the murder of your scholars, from the evil ones who murder your disciples. Again, who have torn your pages and trampled your letters. They desecrated the Sifrei Torah. They destroyed the Bate Midrash. They went into the synagogues. And in furious rage have destroyed your homes. Beg the awesome one to heal the wound, to assemble the scattered folk from among his enemies. Attention, attention. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. Proceed to the nearest. Now, notice what he what he does is after indicating what happened, the history of Torah study. Now the fact that it comes all the way to his day. It comes now to ask for Hashem to bring out the, what I want to call revenge or punishment. Okay, now he continues to restore your captive home that the Messiah may rule in Israel, that he may walk among your fellows, your brethren, to teach your lovely words in the Holy Land, to expel in wrath and rage the arrogant evil ones. A return to the land of Israel, important to Rashi, an awareness of Galut, of the diaspora, but of the Jewish homeland okay, as well. The children of the pious ones, your fellows, your disciples, will establish their foundations for spreading your teachings, that those kept away from your festivals may see Jerusalem, the city of your festivals. Again, that I think that that's a slight uh, reference back to uh, Shloshis Regalim, okay, to the pilgrimage festivals. And again, that connection, and that your mourners may be comforted for the time to come. Remember that when you go to a Shiva house and you want to comfort the mourner, what is, uh, what is the classical statement that we say to the mourner? Amakom yenachem etkem v'tokshar avalei tzion v'yerushalayim. Okay, so we see that connection as well. Okay, so that's why I wanted us to, to read through this, not only to see that it physically and spiritually, mentally, psycho affected Rashi, okay? friends, teachers, others were perhaps killed as a result, but at the same time, okay, remembering that situation and the fact that like others who will come after him, okay, they too will rewrite 
uh, pieces of liturgy. Could I see the book one more time? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to you at the end of the class. Okay. All right. So let's come back just to finish. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. So I want to grasp as we bring to begin to close a quote from Sharashevsky, trying to summarize a little bit. Okay. Uh, for the moment. Sharashevsky comes to the conclusion that the last years of his, his fruitful life seem to have been overshadowed by the tragedies which befell the Jews of Western Europe in the course of the First Crusades, okay? when hordes of French and German peasants massacred the Jews in the Rhineland. It is quite likely that the hardships and losses sustained by the Jewish communities he knew so well had an adverse effect on Rashi's health. Toward the end of his life, he was confined to his bed, too weak to write, so that he was compelled to dictate his response to his grandson and to some of his friends. How long did he live? How old? I'd have to go back and look. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. Proceed to the nearest accident, leave the building. Okay, aware of the many Jews who chose martyrdom over baptism, okay, we might want to look to see if there's any sort of source other than this slicha, okay, to Rashi's feelings about that. All right, and that is what we're going to look at to finish today. Okay, one more text. This is just a single page. Okay, this will give us. Okay. In the book of Isaiah, okay, Yeshayahu, towards the uh, towards the end of the Sefer, there is a section that's called. Uh, in English, the suffering servant. Okay, we're going to look at the pasuk. Okay, and then we're going to look at Rashi's commentary, and this is what we're going to finish up with today. Okay, in Yeshayahu fifty-three nine. Thank you. All right, thank you again. And the pasuk vayitin et hershaim kivro vet ashir b'motav alo hamas asa velo mirmatot. And his grave was set among the wicked and the rich in his death, though he had done no injustice and had spoken no falsehood. Now, Christian interpretation assigns this particular pasuk to Yashki. Okay? However, as we look at Rashi, I want us to see what he writes here. And I'm going to do it, read it together in English. And he gave his grave to the wicked. He subjected himself to be buried according to anything the wicked of the heathens, namely, another text has nations, would decree upon him. For they would penalize him with death and the burial of donkeys in the intestines of the dogs. In other words, when the massacre of these cities came, they just killed them and threw their bodies all of them. To the wicked, according to the will of the wicked, he was willing to be buried and he would not deny the living God. And clearly, Rashi is referring to the fact they would not convert. They would rather die on, by their own hand as martyrs or a victim. And to the wealthy with his kinds of death. And to the will of the ruler, he subjected himself to all kinds of death that he decreed upon him because he did not wish to agree to denial of the Torah, to commit evil and to rob like the other heathens, nations. And there was no deceit in his mouth to accept idolatry, but to accept the pagan god a pagan deity as God. Now, now notice, I just want one last comment. Okay, the Kabel Alab Avodat, supposed to be Akum. 
kum. But remember, there were Christian censors that would look at the text. And so Rashi had to write it in such a way that it would pass them. So why did, what does the English translation show us? In parentheses is Parshandata. Parshandata was the name that later generations, particularly his son, grandsons, and great-grandsons gave to Rashi. Parshandata means the commentary. Who would they be referring to as the, in other words, who was the author that wrote it? Clearly it was Rashi. So I, my point is that not only do we Attention. see Attention. here Attention. in the elegy, okay, in Akina, that Rashi was re affected by this terrible events of the First Crusade, but we see even in this example of his commentary on Nach, on the prophets, that he attempted still to, to defend and to try to understand and explain, okay, what was the situation. Next, next time we'll pick up then, okay, with the fact that uh, uh, how does this reflect on the change then of relationship that between Jews and Gentiles that were generally up to the time of the First Crusade was fairly, at least in Rashi's area, uh, amenable, and then what happens afterwards. From there, then we'll go on to talk ultimately, uh, finishing up about the Crusades and the history, and then talk about what was Rashi's lasting influence, okay? And that means we'll talk a little bit about the Tosafot, okay? His uh, sons, his, his son-in-laws, his grandsons, and ultimately, <laughs> other members of Rashi's family who also had an impact on Ashkenazic Jewry. Okay. When you say Rashi's influence, is that the fact that you still study today? That's true. But it's not on him, it's the Okay. Okay, everybody, thank you and thank you for putting up with the uh, situation. It could be. Okay. Attention, attention, attention. An emergency situation has been detected in this building. Proceed to the nearest exit and leave the building. If you want, yeah. We're going to look at one more text in that the group. Just. Attention. 